8. The Holy Family It is not accidental that Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, was also a member of a human family. The Incarnation was a reality, and basic to its reality was the nativity of Jesus in a Hebrew family and as the heir of a royal line. Christ was born in fulfillment of prophecy and in terms of laws basic to the family. Several aspects of this fact are immediately apparent. First, Jesus Christ was born as heir to the throne of David, and in fulfillment of promises concerning the future meaning of that throne. In 2 Samuel 7.12, God declares to David, When thy days shall be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. This promise is celebrated in Psalm 89 and Psalm 132. This kingdom of the Messiah, or Christ, is quote-unquote his kingdom, 2 Samuel 7.12, and is defined in terms of him. Second, Christ's kingdom is the restoration of authority, law, and order. As promised in Isaiah to the faithful, I will restore thy judges as at the first, and thy counselors as at the beginning. Afterward thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Isaiah 1, 26. Since the judges or authorities were established at Sinai or as a result of Sinai, so the law of God will be re-established as a result of the new Sinai, Golgotha, by the greater Moses, Jesus Christ. Accordingly, the Messiah is spoken of as the one in whom and under whom law and order are brought to fulfillment. He is the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice, from henceforth even forever. Isaiah 9, 6-7 We are also told of this shoot of the stock of Jesse, that with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. Isaiah 11.4 He comes to bring justice and to slay the wicked. Isaiah 11.4 To restore paradise, so that, figuratively speaking, the wolf and the lamb dwell together. Isaiah 11.6 and 9 And the earth is restored to greater fertility and blessedness. The wilderness and the parched land shall be glad, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Isaiah 35.1 Third, Christ's kingdom is not limited, like David's, to Canaan. It covers the earth. Christ said to his disciples, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Matthew 5.5 5. St. Paul said, For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Romans 4.13 This important declaration means, according to Hodge, quote, The word heir in Scripture frequently means secure possessor. Hebrews 1, 2, 6, 17, 11, 7, etc. This use of the terms probably arose from the fact that among the Jews, possession by inheritance was much more secure and permanent than that obtained by purchase. The promise was not to Abraham nor to his seed, that is, neither to the one nor to the other. Both were included in the promise and by his seed, is not here as in Galatians 3.16 meant Christ, but his spiritual children, end quote. The second half of the verse, as Murray points out, discussing Romans 4.13 in relation to 4.16-17, makes clear the meaning of law and faith with respect to the heirs. The real heirs are by faith. Quote, and these verses also establish the denotation as being not the natural descendants of Abraham, but all both of the circumcision and the uncircumcision who are of the faith of Abraham, verse 16. The promise is, therefore, that given to all who believe and all who believe are Abraham's seed, end quote. Abraham's true heirs are not by blood or law, but those who share Abraham's faith. These receive their inheritance from the King, Jesus Christ. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, Galatians 3.29. Some seek to deny Christ's kingship over the earth by citing John 18.36, My kingdom is not of this world. Few verses are more misinterpreted. As Westcott noted, quote, 
yet he did claim a sovereignty, a sovereignty of which the spring and the source was not of earth, but of heaven, end quote. My kingdom is not of this world means it, quote, does not derive its origin or its support from earthly sources, end quote. In other words, Christ's kingdom is not derived from this world because it is of God and is over the world. Fourth, Christ by his virgin birth was a new creation, a new Adam, like Adam, a miracle, a creation directly from God. But, unlike Adam, who had no link to any earlier humanity, Christ was linked to the old humanity by his birth from Mary. St. Luke cited both Adam and Jesus as the Son of God, Luke 1, 34-35, and chapter 3, verse 38. Christ is thus the second man, or the last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, 45-47, the fountainhead of a new humanity. By his birth of God and of the Virgin Mary, Jesus Christ is head of the new race, as the new Adam, to provide the earth with a new seed, to supplant the old Adamic race. The first Adam was tempted in paradise and fell. The new Adam was tempted in the Adamic wilderness and began there the restoration of paradise. He was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. Mark 1.13 Communion was restored by the second man, with the angels of heaven and the animals of the earth. As the true Adam, he exercised dominion, Genesis 1.28, and as the Lord of the earth, he issued his law on the mount, confirming the law he had earlier given through Moses, Matthew 5.1 through 7.29. In the ancient world, the king was the lawgiver, and a lawgiver was thus either the king or an agent of the king, as in the case of Moses. Jesus, by declaring in the Sermon on the Mount, I say unto you, declared himself to be the king, and by his great commission made it clear that his kingship is over all the earth. Matthew 28, 18-20. Fifth, Jesus Christ as king of the earth has the right of dominion. This means that he attacks and overthrows all those who deny his dominion. As God declared, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it and it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him. Ezekiel 21, 27. This overturning of his enemies continues today. Hebrews 12, 25-29. Sixth, Jesus Christ was born under the law and into law to fulfill the law. This fulfillment he began from his birth by his membership in the Holy Family, where, as a dutiful son, he kept the fifth commandment all his days. As the legal heir of a royal throne, he laid claim to the God-given promises, and as legal king of the earth, he is in process of dispossessing all false heirs and all enemies from his possession. Seventh, Jesus Christ obeyed the family law. As a dutiful son, he made provision for his mother from the cross. John was given to Mary as her new son to care for her. But the new quote-unquote son Christ gave to Mary was in terms of the family of faith, John 19, 25-27, so that Christ indicated that true heirship, for the heir inherits responsibilities, is by faith more than by blood. This principle he had earlier declared with reference to his mother and brothers. When their doubts led them to a position of fearfulness with respect to his calling, he declared his true family to be whosoever shall do the will of my father, Matthew 12:50. He did not thereby separate himself from his responsibility to his mother, whose care was his dying concern. In the Holy Family, therefore, the biblical law of the family is clearly exemplified. Particularly in his heirship, Jesus Christ demonstrated the responsibility of an heir. As heir of a family, he fulfilled his family responsibilities. As heir to a throne, he met his royal obligations. As heir to the racial mantle as the second Adam, he met his duties to the race. He thus demonstrated that heirship is responsibility.